Well, hello everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Chilling with the Villain podcast. It's Royal Rumble season. We're all excited for the Royal Rumble, one of the best pay per views of the year. And today, as we're in the Rumble spirits, we're reviewing and checking out Royal Rumble 2002. Seemed to be a lot of good pay per views in the year 2002. Quite the underrated year, if you ask me. Everyone talks about the golden age of professional wrestling. People talk about the Attitude Era. But I feel like we neglect the year 2002. But we don't do that here on the podcast. Yes, we are the Chilling with the Villain podcast, a classic wrestling review. And you can listen to us every week where we go back and watch a classic wrestling pay-per-view. Then review it for you that I used to watch wrestling types. Maybe you are watching wrestling still now. You're all welcome here on the podcast. Uh, joining me today, as always, he is the producer of the show. Sam, how are you? I'm really good. I think it's because I'm in it's Royal Rumble season and I'm in Royal Rumble, that kind of mood. Seems like everybody is because we covered Royal Rumble 98 last week and the views or listens, however you want to consider them, pretty good. Pretty good. People are definitely in Royal Rumble mood. Are you? I think so. I was quite excited to watch the Royal Rumble this year. Um, and realistically, you want to watch it live, don't you? You don't really want to be spoiled on something like who wins the Rumble. Mm. And mm. I was going to say, unfortunately, but I guess this is, you know, maybe not unfortunately, but I'm wrestling that night. So I'm not sure how I'm going to navigate that. Part of me right. was like, shall I cancel my booking just so I can chill out at home and watch the Rumble? <laughs> Which I'm not going to do, by the way. But um, Maybe I'll have it on on my phone backstage and then out there <laughs> and do my match. But no, I, I, I enjoy the Rumble. And I think as a creative type, I'm always interested in watching the Royal Rumbles because for mm. it to be good, I think we've kind of discussed this on the show before, the, the way that it's booked is kind of very important. Do you know what I mean? There's yeah. some matches where you can just book just like two great wrestlers and they'll go out there and they'll do the work. They'll just put on a great match and they might not even need to have a story, anything else. But you could put 30 great wrestlers into a rumble, but with no kind of structure mm. or story or moments or whatever it might be, it can end up not being that great of a, a match. So, and at the same time, you can have not so great wrestlers in a Royal rumble, but if it's, if it's booked beautifully, then it can be great. The best thing ever. So I'm always interested to see, how the Royal Rumble is. And it's funny, it's 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 quite inconsistent, the Royal Rumble, I feel. Like some of them really, really enjoyable and just fantastic. And then some of them you think, oh, that was quite a letdown. And I will say that I think with the Royal Rumble, there's always pretty high expectations. Would you think, oh, think yeah. it's fair to say? Oh, yeah. I have I, really high expectations every time. Uh, yeah, and I think that sometimes that can let people down. I know there was a Royal Rumble a few years ago. I can't remember which one, but which I felt very underwhelmed by and my friend said to me like well what were you expecting and i'm like well you could have had like x puck return or something <laughs> i don't know um but are you gonna name that rumble or i can't remember which it? one it was oh you can't remember okay i thought no. you were leaving it anonymous to no there was a rumble a while back uh but maybe not that so long ago and they had the, the men's rumble and the women's rumble on the same night and the women's rumble was far more enjoyable than the men's and i remember the men's just like nothing really happening. Just, yeah. it, but then the girls that seemed a bit more excited. It might have been the one when they had um, Ivory came out as the right sensor, which was a huge pop. Oh, yeah. Um, like, obviously, the surprises aren't everything with the Rumble, but I feel like in this day and age, if there isn't a few, at least a few good surprises, you do feel kind of let down. Oh yeah, hundred percent. It's certainly a component, right? What makes a good rumble? It is that wild is. card element. Yep, I like it's, it. Exactly. I was kind of let down by the one we watched last week, actually ninety eight. So, well, we, we will find out if this one's better. Yeah, the the attitude era. We, we're, we're learning that quite yep. a lot on this show. That the attitude era made for great television, great Monday Night Raws. Yeah, not so great pay per views, <laughs> but all fun. Well, Denise, talk about the Attitude Era. I guess you count this as the Attitude Era. A few weeks ago, you and I were discussing which event 
I guess we'd call it, or which angle we found more egregious, whether it was David Arquette winning the World Heavyweight title in WCW, which we covered on the podcast, one of the first episodes, or the Finger Poke of Doom, which we covered a few weeks ago. So both those shows go back and listen. They're very, very, very fun. And you put, you did a poll, Sam, yeah. and how the results come back? 50-50. Over 800, I know, over 800 people voted. And it went right down the middle, 50-50. Legit yeah. 50-50, right? Yeah. 50%, yeah. 50%. Because, yeah. and that's not a case of like, oh, we just had two people vote. Like there was yeah, a whole exactly. bunch of yeah. votes. You and, and me. Still, and it still came to 50-50. It was very, first of all, that never happens, which is just, mm-hmm. so it's a funny event. But also, I'm... I'm very surprised. Really? Are you? Mm. No, uh, no, because I, I really, like, it came up on my Instagram. Obviously, I have my personal Instagram account, and I was like, oh, I should vote, and you know, just to make up numbers. And um, I, I wasn't sure which one to go with. And then I, I think I eventually decided on Arquette winning the world title. And again, I, I voiced my reasons for that before. And even though it could possibly happen an actor winning the world title in the way that he did. The reason why I thought it was more egregious was just because not, no knock on David Arquette. I've met him before. Very nice guy, super cool guy, but it didn't seem like to me that he was like an A-list celebrity or actor. So I think that really kind of hurt that. So I ended up going with David Arquette winning the world title, but again, both extremely egregious. (laughs) You're an old school kind of kayfabe guy, though, and mm-hmm. that w- that storyline is more plausible for the kind of art of wrestling, right? Than the finger poke of doom. I feel like so. I'm actually that I'm actually surprised that you picked David Arquette. But also, what's funny is I think the finger poke of doom is more egregious. So even between the podcast, right. it's fifty fifty. Yeah. <laughs> well, the Kevin Nash one, you could well the finger poke of doom. I felt like if they tried to, because I don't think they ever really explained it other than like, oh, we're getting the NWO back together. But Kevin Nash's kind of whole approach to wrestling and kind of part of his gimmick is how he's always gone where the money is and he's doing this for money. And I feel like it could have made a bit more sense if afterwards, like the next week on Nitro, they explained that Hogan basically paid Nash off, like he paid him whatever, $5 million, whatever. So you feel like they had an out to explain away what happened. They just didn't capitalize on that. Yeah. I mean, it, I, it wouldn't have made the whole thing great. Better. Because I, think yeah, the, great. The, yeah. I just think the, obviously the really egregious part I think about it is the fact that you had a 40,000 people in that arena ready to see a world title match. You just don't give them one, but at least it would have made a bit more sense. Cause the whole thing was like, why would Nash just give the world title to Hogan? Mm-hmm. But if they explained, Oh, he, he paid him off. Could have worked so, out a yeah, little bit better. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Okay. So, yeah. but anyway, we, we, I don't. I think I saw a comment on the Instagram the other day, like, "Why are you trying to work out wrestling logic?" It's like, well, it's kind of what we do here on the podcast, right. <laughs> which is why I, I, I get- wish I could just shut my brain. Well, sometimes I do. It depends on what we're watching, right? Mm-hmm. But I, I kind of like that's part of the appeal to me is the analysis. Maybe yeah. it's not for some people, and that's cool. No. No, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, today we are doing Royal Rumble 2002. I feel like we shouldn't waste any more time. Should we just get into it? Royal Rumble 2002? Yeah, let's go. Let's do it. First thing I want to do is actually analyze the poster. I don't know if you've seen, you probably saw it. You saw the pay-per-view way back when, right? You've probably seen yeah. this before. Okay. So we have the tagline. I was going to make you guess it, but why? you just won't be able to. It's such a clean, lovely tagline. 30 men, one match, one winner. That's nice, right? Nice and simple. And then mm-hmm. if you look closely, they've ruined it by having a, the number one as the I in winner. <laughs> Why would you go and do that? Like you had a lovely little simple no frills tagline and then they just do something really dumb with it. So that's my first music. <laughs> my second one is, do you remember when we were talking about, it was Money in the Bank 2011, where the mm. poster, clear, they clearly had no idea what was going on on with the event by the time they made the poster yes because i don't want to spoil the show but we have the rock as you can see his famous iconic victory pose this is clearly the rock okay it's a silhouette of the rock yes yes well he didn't have a great showing in this pay-per-view spoilers he lost the only match he's in and he wasn't in the royal rumble 
So this yeah. was just like another one of those Hornswoggle Big Show moments. We've got no. something on. Come on. Are Dude, he's wrestling, he's wrestling for the World Heavyweight title. I think you can justify him being on the poster. Do you really? Yeah, he's fighting for the World title. Yeah, well, we'll get to that. The Undisputed <laughs> Championship. Another thing, by the way, I noticed is if you look over here, that's obviously his hand. But you know those things that you scrub yourself with in the shower? <laughs> well, it you looks can't like more like it now, can you? He looks like he's wiping his ass, maybe. Yeah, that's a better one. There we go. I just thought he was just scrubbing his junk with a shower loofah, but yeah, there we well, go. It, see, that's the rock's pose where he goes up to the turnbuckle and raises kind of fist in the air. And the rock, or so they say Dwayne Johnson's pose now, is the he kind of stands there showing off his cufflinks. He like holds his sleeve have you yes yeah, yeah 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 <laughs> it's, it's like it a... doesn't ha it definitely lacks the kind of um for example you couldn't make a silhouette of that uh right? yeah maybe not maybe not and I, I think that definitely that's a sign of a great pose the fact yeah. that you could have a silhouette of said mm -hmm. pose and people could tell what it is and you know what sam that got me thinking it's time it's time for marty and sam's top five As you can probably guess, today's top five is the top five poses in wrestling, mm. or wrestler poses, should we say. And uh, I think we toyed with this idea a few weeks ago on the pod. And we threatened it a couple of weeks ago, and this is one of these rare moments on the podcast where we actually do what we said we were going to do. Yeah. <laughs> so I actually struggled quite a lot with this, because at first I thought, oh, I couldn't really think of many, just off the top of my head. It wasn't like I had really? loads straight away, but then, well, I meant for the first like second, then I was, then I started thinking more and I was like, oh damn, there's a lot of great poses, like a lot. And so I really struggled with my top five. In fact, I have it here now, but I'm still kind of unsure about it. <laughs> that makes sense. Just like this, some, like it, this would have been easy top 10 for me, but top five, I okay. kind of struggled to narrow it down. Do you want me to go first while sure. you work on the ordering of yours? I actually found this very easy. And mm. I'm kind of known on the podcast for having the kind of very kind of basic simpleton lists. And I'm okay with that. When I was looking at this one, I thought, oh, this is definitely one of those. It's a very basic list. And then I thought for the topic of poses, I feel like that kind of, that's perfect. You want, what's the first thing people recognize? What's like the most basic thing you think of? And I think that actually lends into this quite well. There's other, there's other reasons why a pose would be very good. So it's like there could be a lot of character in it and it might not necessarily be an iconic pose. There's things like that. But generally speaking, I feel like, like you said with the silhouette thing, it's just, hey, if this is just easily recognizable by loads of people, I think that's a very high criteria point for these i do have one honorable mention it's just rick rude doing his thing right it's, not, it's kind of like <laughs> yeah it's um it's not like a super unique pose to him it's just a bodybuilder pose i've done that many at the times. same time yeah but at the same time <laughs> it kind of is special to him right it's kind of his oh, whole thing sure. which makes it funny but yeah not top five material top are you five. um your top five are you doing it kind of like your particular favorite poses or are they kind of like the greatest poses honestly i think they're one and the same okay because these are to me what i think are the greatest poses mm -hmm. and they're very, when listen listen to the list you'll make sure oh. you'll hear it will make sense are you stalling to get yours in order no <laughs> no 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 okay so number five i've got the most basic one you can get it's stone cold two arms up the most simple strong pose you can think of when he wins you, you can see it in your head gets up onto the middle turnbuckle thing puts his two arms up no, nothing more needs to be said it's just very iconic number four i have ddp he's the reason why we're doing this list if you recall from the wcw yes indeed episode always got i don't know if he did it in wwe he must have done but it always got a massive pop didn't it in wcw i think it's it's, it's easy to um very easy for the fans yeah. to replicate so yes and it's a good visual when he puts their hands up and makes a diamond yep. shape with his hands, yep. and then the rest of the audience do it. Great, great yeah, visual. It's definitely, definitely. I, I'd be surprised if that's not on your list, but we'll we'll find out. Number three, Randy Orton, of course, right? Another simple. I'm gravitating towards very simple. It seems so outlines, yeah. mm -hmm. and I think that's fine. We're talking about these poses here. 
yeah, Randy Orton, another very strong, very powerful, very characteristic of the the man pose. I love it. With Randy Orton's pose, you kind of have to do it with the eyes shut. It seems it's almost like oh, the yeah. smugness in his face is part of the pose, you know? If you want a, the smugness being part of the pose, <laughs> wait no more. For number two, I've got HBK. You know when he mm. kind of flexes his leg? Sorry, he flexes and his legs are kind of stretched to the one side and the and the... Double bicep. And the pyrotechnics come come off behind him sometimes. Yeah, he's doing the double biceps. He's just got the smuggest face. That's a very... This pose, I feel like, is the one that's most showcases their character the most out of all these poses. Maybe he's, maybe he's Stone Cold as well. But yeah, HBK doing his double bicep flex with his legs stretched to the side. Yeah, number two for me. I love it. A lot of character in that one. Number one. Number one, Marty. If this isn't your number one, I don't know what I've got to say. It's the classic Hulk Hogan bodybuilder pose, right? Well, it's you- so 80s, so muscle man. <laughs> it was such a thing. Like everyone used to do it, right? Well, the like he does all the bite, you know, the most muscular and the muscle poses, which is just awesome. But also, I think the most underrated one is the the hand kind of swivel into cupping. His- then, yes, it's like the perfect. I mean, that was that was a joke constantly on um, Bruce Pritchard's podcast that, you know, when Hogan was on top of the WWF, which was for years, it was always like the show must end with Hogan posing. Like Hogan must right. pose was the, that was the line. Like Hogan must pose. Like people well, see him pose. So he's pose, yeah. It's marketable. Yeah. But so it makes sense. Yeah, for time and just watch Hogan doing his poses to his entrance music is a pretty funny concept when you think about it. I guess, especially because for him, it also lasts, it wasn't 10 seconds and he's done. It was like right. two minutes, wasn't exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I like thinking of poses like when he used to do that and he wasn't in my list, but you know, Chris Jericho doing his arms. Yeah. The entrance thing. It's like, imagine if they didn't have the music. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. The music was broken that day and they still had sure. to do it. It would just lose everything. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I kind of tried to avoid poses where they had to rely on something to prop them up. Mine all that's why mine are so simple. Yeah, but I definitely want to hear yours. Okay, that was that was a great list. So you actually had two of mine. I did have DDP in my top yeah. five and Hogan. So I'm gonna take them out. So it's kind of good that you went first. Where would um, you have put them though? Just so out of curiosity. I had them at four and five. Oh, okay, all right. So yeah. So it's, I'm gonna swap it around. So my number five, my number five, you kind of have to say words with the pose for it to work, but you can still do it, I guess, without the words. Do you know what it is? DX. No. Oh, I thought you can do suck it. Rob Van. Uh, Damn. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and I think that just the reason why it's on my list, I think like he made such a big deal of it. And again, it was something where just instantly recognizable. Like I can do this and you're like, oh, Rob Van Dam. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And the crowd can do it. Just very simple, very clever, like a massive part of Rob Van Dam's act. And yeah, I think that's just a great pose. And again, simple, just pointing your thumbs at yourself. It's a great, it, it kind of just screams his character straight away as well. It does, it does. Did you notice during the rumble, a fan in the crowd had these foam RVD hands that were the thumbs? I've seen them before, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, I haven't seen them <laughs> yeah, before. Yeah. So it's again, it's also marketable. I that's see- definitely a good sign of a pose yes. when it is, yeah. That's very true. I did see an interview a while back with Rob Van Dam. And so I guess... I didn't really notice this, but I guess he would alternate between saying Rob Van Dam uh, or saying RVD. And he said like Shane McMahon told him he needs to stick to one, which would probably make more sense. But yeah, I don't know. I found that kind of interesting. And it's funny, RVD, it's not any quicker saying RVD than mm-hmm. Rob Van Dam. So it kind of makes you wonder why yeah. <laughs> you would initialize it. I don't know. Rob Van Dam is better than RVD, I think. I, I agree. I yeah. agree. When I do it, I'm saying Rob Van Dam. So my number four is not DDP anymore. My number four is Eddie Guerrero's shoulder. Oh, I just bashed my microphone trying to do it. His uh, shoulder yeah. wiggle or swivel, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> I can't really do it here at the podcast chair. Yeah. Um, but Eddie Guerrero, he would fire up and he would start doing, like they like said, oh, he's feeling froggy. He's feeling froggy. But I thought that was really cool how there was like a like a commentary line that went with it. Like, oh, he's feeling froggy. That mm. means he's feeling froggy. And he would do it to fire up. And again, it was something that the audience could do with him. Um, maybe not as like synonymous with him as the Rob Van Dam pose was with RVD. But 
Mm, maybe not. Because the reason why I put this on the list is because you still see people doing it to this day. And you remember like JBL doing it. I think it was JBL after Rob Van Dam died to like get heat, you know? Yeah. Rob Van Dam died? Sorry. Oh my God. Eddie Guerrero. Sorry. After Eddie oh, okay. died. Did I say Rob Van Dam? Yeah. He, oh, yeah. Sorry. He's alive, right? Rob Van Dam's alive. Yeah. Jeez, man. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> no, JBL, I'm pretty sure, did the pose to kind of get heat after yeah, yeah. Eddie died. And now you see like Rhea Ripley doing it and Dominic doing it and they kind of get heat. But if, if Rey Mysterio does it, it gets a big pop. So yeah, I always like that pose for Eddie Guerrero. And it's, it's funny because again, it's like you see that growth from him as a performer from you look at him in like WCW to WWF and he just got better and better. And the WWF kind of brought out that sports entertainment side of him and stuff like this right. that pose kind of adds to, to it all. So yeah, my number four, Eddie Guerrero. My number three was Hogan. I guess now I'm going to go with the great Muta. He would do the pose where he's kind of holding his throat, like he's going to do the miss or has done the miss. And then he would do the kind of almost like the double two sweep and raise his arms out like this. Boom. Normally after he did the shining wizard, uh, but the crowd would just come completely unglued. And I always just thought it was like, he just looks super cool doing it. <laughs> you, know, really, you know, I'm obviously a big fan of great mute, full stop. Right. But again, just like a super famous pose. And if I did this, everyone, well, if you know the great mute, knows exactly who it is and everything else. So he was going to be an honorable mention for me, but now he's in, he's in the third <laughs> spot. So <laughs> there we go. You got a promotion. You mm. seem to be gravitating towards poses that speak to the character more than like silhouette based poses. Like I was doing like, I, I guess so. Poses. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Because like, yeah, I think so. Because obviously, you know, there's the rock doing this. I mean, actually there's a big one that we've both missed out and I guess you would count it as a pose, but what about the rocks people's eyebrow? Yeah, it's a pose. Yeah. It's, it's a, pose, a pose, right? It's a pose. Yeah. That should probably be number one if you think about <laughs> it, but let's carry on. <laughs> well, my number two, I guess you could debate if it's a, if it's a pose or a hand gesture. My number two is the uh, two sweet. Okay. I think like this is, dude, I was in Bullet Club for like, what? I don't know. A couple of years, maybe. And still everywhere I go, where I wrestle to this day, people want to two sweet me. Every single <laughs> show. Without doubt, like and without fail, and every single match I have, the crowd would chant "Too sweet, whoop whoop, too sweet," which seems to they do it for everyone now. It seems, but the too sweet pose, just yeah. I mean, if anything, overdone, but just so famous. Like, like even now in WWE, guys like Machine Gun Anderson and Luke Gallows, they do it, and then you've got guys doing it on AEW and. Everywhere you go, there seems to be people doing the two sweet. I guess they're still doing it in Japan with with the Bullet Club, and obviously it came from the Click back in the day. Then it was the NWO's pose, and it still lives to this day and age. And just like a really kind of symbolic hand gesture that wrestling fans and wrestlers alike love to use. So, but I think that counts as a pose, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, like a hand gesture is still a pose, I guess. Yeah, and it's. I was thinking this. I actually thought of Rob Van Dam during my list, but not for that, which would have made much more sense if I heard <laughs> it now. But I was thinking the kind of iconic um, physical mannerism that he does during the five star frog splash, like that extra kind of bit to make it a frog. Would you consider that a pose? No. You could just do as you, you wouldn't? No. I know what you're saying, but I wouldn't consider that a pose. Okay. He's doing like, it's, it's a move, but. He's making it look more flashy, but I like adding a flow, like these flourishes that make something better or more mm -hmm. flashy than it was. You wouldn't consider them poses. No, okay. I'm trying to think of an example of where I would like the word. Like I was going to say people's elbow. Would you consider that a pose? It's kind of like a pose into the move, I guess. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like the part where he stands over them mm -hmm. at the start and takes his elbow pad off has Again, I'm a silhouette kind of guy. It, I would say that would cons I would definitely consider that a pose. Too sweet, I I would. There's no question. But I, there is. Mm. I was having this debate with myself the other day because that's the type of weirdo that I am. So Austin three sixteen, right? Mm. He, he did that in that promo where he's cutting a promo on Jake and at the King of the Ring when he won it in ninety six, and since then it became you know such a big deal. Everyone having the signs Austin three sixteen. 
sold loads and loads of t-shirts of Austin 316. It's kind of funny because when you think about it, it's like it doesn't really mean anything. And it's very, really quite simple. But the Austin 316, does that count as a catchphrase? Oh, uh, I thought you could say it's a pose. I was going to say you've completely no. lost no, it. No, 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 no. I would say it's Is that a catchphrase? catchphrase? Yep. Or is it a yep. tagline? Like, what is it? And no, I'd say it's a catchphrase. That, and is there yeah. any other examples of it? Is it a catchphrase, though? Why, why would a, you say it isn't? Because it's short or because it's mostly um, alluded to? Because he didn't go around saying it every time. Like, it's his motto. It seemed, it seemed more like a, yeah, like a tagline or a motto. Like, mm. it seemed more like something he would have on his truck or on his T-shirt rather than... I mean, he would say, Austin 316 says, I just whipped your ass. That's the kind of catchphrase. Right. But the Austin 316 part, does it count as a catchphrase? I guess it's uh, more like a, yeah. And Ugh. I thought if it's like a tagline or a motto, I can't really think of any other examples of wrestlers that would have that. I really want to, let me get back to you on this. <laughs> I want to find, I want to find this out. And guys, if you're listening, help us. Yeah, let's know. There must think. be something. We must. Do be you missing. think Austin three sixteen is a catchphrase? Catch let's go. Yeah. Okay, so coming in at number one, you've already kind of mentioned it, but my number one is the famous DX. Suck it, the crotch chop. It has to be up there. Like this, the reason why it's my number one is because it kind of transcended wrestling, right? Like. Mm. Dude, if you were in school in the late 90s, everyone was doing the <laughs> All the chop, kids were right? doing it, yeah. Everyone was. And just, yeah. Well, you know, it got banned in schools. In the majority of schools, it got banned. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm actually looking at a picture now. Um, maybe I'll try and upload this onto the social media. But I'm about 10 years old or maybe 12 years old. It's a picture of me uh, with my friend, Joe Savins. We're both wearing the DX jersey, the 69 one. And we've got getting a picture with Marty Giannini and we're both doing the crotch chops in the picture. <laughs> it's like, that had nothing to do with Marty Giannini, but we're still just like, still doing it. Marks. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's wrestling adjacent. We'll do it. Right. But yeah, so it, funny. it almost seemed like I, I'm assuming the crotch chop was around before professional wrestling, but you know, wrestling made it famous and made it a big thing. So yeah, I, I think you, you just do that and people instantly know, what it's about and everything else. So, and it always like anyone that does a crotch chop in WWE, it's always going to get a massive reaction. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it, it, it kind of, um, it gets a reaction out of people, you know? So oh, for, for me, sure. that just yeah. seemed like if out of all these poses, if you had to ask me which one I'd done the most, actually it's probably too sweet, but that's just because I was in the bullet club. It's kind um, of your job at but, that point. Yeah. I, yeah. But as a fan, which one have I done yeah. the most? It would have been, the suck it for sure because i did that a lot of times as a youngster <laughs> if, it, if it was if the list was what is the number one pose for the era that kind of like it described what the whole era was about yeah. in one pose i would say the dx crotch chop is definitely there you know absolutely it was full of attitude so yes it definitely 100%. did the job what it was absolutely. supposed to do all right. What's funny is I actually thought our, my list was kind of de quite definitive and I thought ours would be pretty much the same, but I guess not. You know, everyone's going to have a different pose that comes to mind for different reasons. So I do want to hear other people's. I bet I bet people are screaming out thinking of, I can't think of one, but um, Kane, when he does his thing before the yeah. pyro comes down, that would be one. I bet people There's have so many. so many. You There's know, so many. We should maybe do like top five, like worst poses, like the poses that people tried that didn't work or didn't get over. Okay. Do you remember yeah. like, the, like, he might still do it. And maybe it's gone over my head, but for a while when The Rock came back, he was doing like, this kind of pose where I think he made like a U sign with his hand. Maybe he just did Vaguely, it because it was yeah. like a part of a university's. Uh, maybe it wasn't his thing. I'm not sure, but either way, that, that might yeah. be quite an interesting list as well. <laughs> that would, that would. All right. Shall we crack on? Yeah, let's get into the show. Okay. Royal Rumble 2002. The show begins with a trip down memory lane as it recounts the winners and standout moments of Royal Rumble's past, while eventually leaving that behind and focusing on the contenders for tonight's show. Incidentally, it's worth pointing out that they show these photographs of past events as the camera pans across them all kind of laterally, 
And so you assume it's like a composite, like they did it in After Effects or something, just got the images and stuff and just like packed it a digital pan sort of thing. But towards the end of it, the camera zooms out a little and kind of changes direction, pans off to the distance and you discover that it was actually a physical setup the whole time where they actually had photos and they nailed them to pieces of wood and stuff. And I just yeah. thought it was, a really, it was just really, really cool. And it just shows, we talk about this every time we watch a WWE pay-per-view, whether we like the pay-per-view or not. It just shows how much effort that WWE just put into everything, like every facet of what makes an event, you know? We're then brought to the Phillips Arena in Atlanta, Georgia. The attendance is a sold out crowd of 16,106. Now, guess the buy rate. And if you want a clue, I'll give you a ridiculous clue. I feel like I've got this wrong and we might have to look it up again on it. Like this seems way too high. Mm, 2002 Rumble. I think it did good. There was one year where the Royal Rumble, I think it actually happened twice, but around this time period where the Royal Rumble did better uh, buy rates than the WrestleMania that year. And I can't remember if it was this one. Um, judging by what you're saying, I'm also going to Google it as well, but I'm going to give my answer before I find yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to say like uh, 450. Go up a crazy amount. <laughs> I don't know, 650. Yeah, 670,000. It's on Wikipedia, is that? Yeah, Damn. and I've and I'm looking at other places now and they're all saying wow, yeah. it could have been. I mean, is this the one where in 2002 the WrestleMania would have been what WrestleMania 18, right? Mm. A buy rate. What did Oh, that was do? a bang. I wish you'd cover that one day. Oh, we do need to do that. I'm trying to find Okay, so the the WrestleMania buy rate that year was 860,000. Wow. Business was doing good for WWE, I guess. <laughs> These numbers, yeah, I'm, I've, I'm looking at other places as well, and they're all saying 670,000 and also pointing wow. out that that is a very good number, yeah. That's got to be like the highest rated Royal Rumble ever, huh? Yes, at that time, I believe, but maybe still, I don't know. Yeah. 670K, that, that's nuts. The Royal Rumble 99 did 650,000 buys, damn. Um, okay, so apparently, or at least according to this website, this is the highest rated Royal Rumble in terms of buy rates ever. 670,000 wow. pay-per-view buys. Damn, business was was hot, huh? <laughs> Mate, you, yes. Yeah, that's pretty insane, huh? Okay, well, I'm glad we <laughs> double-checked that and it was correct. That's nuts. That's great. Yeah. Damn. Also, yeah. we know it's 2002 because they cut back to WWF Times Square, just Ooh. like they did for... Yep, yeah, for Survivor Series 2002, which we covered. No Stacey Keebler or oh. Saliva this time oh. round, unfortunately. Or so you thought, because Stacey appears straight away to accompany the Dudley boys down to the ring for the first match of the night, where they promptly lose to the reigning champions that are Spike Dudley and Taz in five minutes, oh six, because Devon, he taps out to the sub, uh, to the submission. It's got a name, you know, you, you not know, just any funny. submission, the Taz mission, but, it's, but yeah, it's oh, 2002. Sorry. Of course, Stacy's going to be on it. Were you crazy? <laughs> what are you going to say? Well, what's funny is that, you know, this is the January, 2002 and the tag team division, you think about the, the WrestleMania before this, when they had TLC two or whatever it was, you know, the Dudleys, the Hardys, and Edge and Christian. And yeah. just, you know, and there's other tag teams around, like the APA, et cetera, et cetera. And it's funny when we watch these pay-per-views, sometimes the tag team division is really strong and sometimes it's really weak. Like a while back, I think we covered, was it Judgment Day? And like the tag champs were Rico and Charlie Haas and they yes, were wrestling yeah, a yeah. makeshift team of Billy Gunn and Hardcore Holly. And here, yeah, I mean, another one. We've, we've got the Dudleys, but like, like Spike and Taz yes. as the tag team champions. It's clearly like, oh, they they really didn't care so much about the tag right. team division <laughs> at this point. Well, I say that it sounds kind of like I'm burying the teams, but um, no, it, honestly, you know, uh, as far as the match, it was fine. It was cool. This yeah. was the the Dudleys as heels, and they'd put uh, Stacy Keebler with them. Kind of felt like they had Stacy Keebler. She wasn't a wrestler, so they didn't really know what to do with her, but they knew they wanted her on TV. So it's like, oh, let's put her 
with the Dudley boys didn't really make a whole lot of sense, but I guess as well with the Dudley boys, it always kind of felt like after 2001, at least they were always trying to like revamp them somewhat or do something different with them. And it is hard, you know, when you're a tag team and you're, you know, you've won the tag team titles 15 times. It's kind of like, what do you do? Do you you know what I mean? Like, so (laughs) they constantly have to change their act. Uh, Someone that had changed their act, Taz, I think we discussed him on the show before. And I, I don't want to sound like I'm burying Taz, but it seemed like in he was very good at the role that Paul Heyman gave him in ECW, which was, you know, guy that kind of killed people and dropped them on their heads. And he got really over and I was a fan. But when he came to the WWE and he couldn't do that anymore, they obviously needed quite a, a lot more sort of depth uh, to his gimmick. And that, that's the thing that kind of annoys me. People were saying like, well, WWE ruined Taz. It's like, well, they haven't ruined him just because, Like they can't portray him the exact same way he's been portrayed before in something like WWE. Do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, they could, I guess, but it's kind of like they do TV every week. If his gimmick is he just beats everyone up, like where does that go? Do you know what I mean? You need more depth to it. We need more character development. We we need to have longer matches, et cetera, et cetera. So they brought him in and um, it seemed like right away, didn't really know what to do with him. And I don't know what happened to Taz. I assume he maybe had a collection of injuries because I think what really kills it for me with Taz in the WWF or WWE was the, uh, the transition from the leotard to the tracksuit. Body Basically what I'm wearing now. Like yeah. The, like a boy yeah, looks suit. like a mechanic. Yeah. Right. And I think that, that also I think made him look, looked like a lot shorter and just a lot less it did. intimidating. So I mean, I'm assuming I, I don't think it was like a creative idea for him. I'm assuming maybe he had injuries and got a little bit out of shape and yeah. decided to wear that instead but because it's almost like the way he's presented here it's almost like he's like the same him and spike dudley are the short men you know what I mean? like <laughs> yeah and for me yeah just taz in the wwf just didn't really work but yeah here's kind of like an ecw kind of themed match spike dudley's always fun to watch but um yeah, yeah to me it seemed a little bit disappointing that uh the tag division was just kind of like a throwaway did we mm. We did get Spike with the Dudley Boys in the WWF. Yes, we did. Yeah. It was always kind of interesting to see him wrestle them. But I don't know, Sam, what what are your opinions? Like you said, I wrote the exact same thing. I was like, this was fine. I mean, Mm -hmm. I liked it. It was good. But it wasn't a banger opener. And like we talked about with Justin Gabriel, right? PJ Black. Like We need a banger opener Mm -hmm. and a banger closer for a pay-per-view. And I don't think that should not be the case for a Royal Rumble pay-per-view just because we also get the Rumble. I think we should always strive for a banger. And this was just okay. Do you You feel like with the Dudley Boys matches, do you think it just got to the point where the audience was just waiting? Waiting for for that table, huh? Right? Yeah, of course. Kind of seems like that, huh? I'm not trying to take it away from the Dudley Boys because they were a great act and everything. Yeah, I think they're yeah. great. I was going to say almost kind of felt like it hindered them somewhat. The fact that it's not like they had to rely on the tables, but then again, come to think about it, it's kind of like they kind of did almost have to rely on the tables because it was almost like the people were just, you know, they expected to see them. I guess you could argue like, Oh, well it's like stone cold and the stunner or the rock and the people's elbow, but you know, cause it was their move. But yeah, I do feel like that with the, with the Dudley match, it's like, Oh, we want tables. I'm the first guy who would admit that I love watching people go through tables. Okay. Mm -hmm. First guy. Love it. It's my favorite thing. I always felt like though, for me, the Dudley boys were always better and bigger than that. To me, the first thing I think of when I think of the Dudley boys are these power double team, creative, powerful double team moves. Yeah. Not just the 3D, but they always come up with others and they always look really brutal and really fiendish and they were really clever and smart as well. And I'm going to go ahead and say, I feel like they're the second Legion of Doom in that regard. Legion mm. of Doom to me is like the, the double team move powerhouse guys. I always felt like the Dudleys are kind of like the second coming of that. Not, not to the same level, but that's what I always think of. I always wanted to see what crazy double team moves. I always had like the double team flapjacks, the double, like they always do, all these cool double team mm-hmm. moves and no one's saying, Oh, I want to see them do a double team move apart from maybe the head, butt to the groin. Mm-hmm. 
the WhatsApp. They always yeah. like tables, you know. It's, we just want tables. I always thought they were more than that, and it seems a little bit disappointing. I will, I will note, just like how they put Tess and Albert together, just so they could give Trish Stratus to do TNA. I noticed when they have Stacey Keebler, they're they're wearing shirts that say I've got wood. It's like oh. so somebody put somebody is like, who do we put Stacey with? It's like, oh, we've we can sell a <laughs> we can sell a comedy shirt with this one, put them with the Dudleys. But yeah, I always felt like they were better than what they were portrayed or what people wanted from them. That's just my two cents. It's interesting that you know, the 3D might be one of the you know, might be the greatest tag team move of all time. And it always impressed me how well the Dudley boys hit that move every single time like every never, time yeah. it never seemed to mess it up ever i mean i'm sure they did at one point but it always seemed so smooth and the timing on that always seemed really good it seems like timing wise a really hard move to pull off and perform but they just nailed it every single time so credit to the dudley boys yeah there we go <laughs> there we go we're treated after this to a recap of an edge and william regal feud okay for some reason, this recap was playing back at an absurdly low frame rate. It was like a slideshow. Did you notice that? I, was like, I didn't really notice. This? Yeah, it was frustrating <laughs> to watch. Edge then talks about chairs to Lillian Garcia. Now, with tables, ladders, and chairs in the three tag teams, wasn't chairs for Edge and Christian always the weakest one? Well, it like felt far. very, it felt forced, and then they tried to yeah. make it their thing. Like it's obvious that the Dudley boys had tables. Then it was like Hardy's oh, the, had ladders. Hardy's are great yeah, with ladders because sure. Jeff jumps off the ladder. Then it's like, well, we'll be the chairs, and they made it. I mean, they're still doing it to this day. They're only uh, AEW now, still doing the concerto, but yeah. it did seem kind of like a little bit forced. Definitely the third rung one out of those three. So yeah, he's talking about chairs to Lillian Garcia. After which we are treated to William Regal beating Edge via pinfall in nine minutes forty five seconds to win the IC belt. You said treated, which I'm mm. going to dispute because I don't know no. if we were. I don't know if we were treated with this match, and you also said it was nine minutes something. It felt like double that. <laughs> um, a few things. <laughs> Edge, they were trying really hard. It's like I was watching this, thinking, "Wow, they were really trying to get Edge to that next level," and mm. he did get a lot of opportunities. It seemed like it seemed like they really wanted him to be a top guy. Yeah, yeah. and it didn't really happen until the whole. Uh, R-rated superstar thing with Lita and everything else yep. that kind of took him to the next level. But here in uh, early 2002, he just he just wasn't really connecting fully with the audience. And this match, I don't know whose fault it was, but the crowd at the start of the show seemed really up and just like, rowdy and everything else. The crowd is just silent for this match. Like, did you notice that how quiet the crowd were? The, the yeah, a little board. bit. I I felt like because we should bring up this is William Regal, so there's obviously a lot of shenanigans going mm -hmm. on, like hill shenanigans, which I love, and I'm surprised. I feel like you're kind of hard on William Regal. I always think he's really. I, I love. I love this kind of thing that he does. I love it. I, but I feel I like you had to kind of keep your um. Silence. Say that again. I said I love the shenanigans, but it was done to silence. Like, well, I I feel like this one, all the shenanigans, you had to really kind of focus on. Mm. And they're probably in the crowd. If they're watching from their seats, they're probably like, "What's going on?" They're just walking around. To them, they're probably just walking around. Mm. I think that yeah. may be it. But I loved it. Well, I didn't love it, but I had fun. It was a nice mix of in-ring stuff and character and shenanigans and horseplay. And you know, I love it. Oh, I'm the complete opposite. I just, I know, I, thought, I know you are, man. I thought that, like, I don't know. Watch it back and just watch the crowd. Like they were just so sat on their hands during the whole thing, and I was like, "Oof!" I just. I don't know. wasn't wasn't really for me. That like I obviously I'm a wrestler and I focus a lot on that. Like to me, right. a great match is where the crowd's going insane. So like the greatest right. match of all time, I could argue was Rock and Hogan from right. 18 because the crowd's yeah. just going absolutely insane. insane. Here uh, is a complete opposite. So I wasn't really a fan. Okay, I enjoyed it. You didn't enjoy it, and that's okay. Our differences of opinion, that's all part of life's rich tapestry, isn't it, Martin? Absolutely is. Jacqueline comes out not to fight Chavo or Disco this time, but instead to officiate between champ Trish Stratus and contender Jazz, who Trish vanquishes via pinfall in 3 minutes 43, retaining her championship belt. Now, mate... 
there was a bit in this where Trish is laid out on the mat and Jazz kind of, she turns around and starts thoroughly disrespecting Jackie, who's the referee. And the crowd are just like waiting. They're just wanting their payoff of Jackie teaching Jazz a bit of respect. And like, they're just waiting for it. And it's set up and it's filmed for it. And then it just doesn't happen. Nothing happens. They just stare at each other. And then Jazz just walks backwards, distracted by Jackie, towards Trish, who's on the ground. So you're like, oh, it's a fake out. She's going to do like a roll up, right? That also doesn't happen. And instead, Jazz just gingerly sits down on top of Trish. It's like the weirdest stilted thing I think I've ever seen in wrestling. I, I, I know to capitalize on the opportunity of two payoff bits. It, it, like, so people were always, okay, I'm probably going to get some hate for this, but people were always put over Jazz like she was such an amazing women's wrestler. Okay. And like she was good at like, like she had some good aggression. So like her fundamentals yes. of doing stuff like body slams and clotheslines was very good. But I think to state that she was a great wrestler, I'm like, can you really think of any great uh, jazz matches? And I guess the argument may be, well, the girls didn't get chance to you know, mm-hmm. have great matches back then, but it's not like she got over to a, you know, wide audience, which is what I kind of try to base stuff on. And also I'd argue the psychology just wasn't there. There was that point where she's arguing with Jacqueline and all they had to do was Jazz get up in Jacqueline's face. Maybe Jazz could push Jacqueline. Jacqueline pushes her back and Trish rolls her up like that old classic spot we've seen a hundred times and the place would have exploded. Instead, they just didn't, you know, they went against it for some reason. Again, kind of lost the crowd really. Um, yeah totally and lost me yeah yeah lost me and you see here like trish is still super duper green but she's yeah. she's trying hard jacqueline where does she rank on our um special guest referee outfits <laughs> oh i like it i like it she's no hbk she's no okay. hbk still no i feel HBK. like she misses the top five but she's in the top 10 uh, jazz was she ecw she was in ECW for a little bit. Yeah, yeah I haven't really seen, Okay, I don't really know much about her, but I wouldn't fully kind of put the blame on her because after that bit where there's no roll up and she just sits down on top of Trish, Jackie just kind of stands there and looks confused like she's having a brain error. Oh. <laughs> and I don't know if it was a bit or if she forgot what she's... I don't know. The whole thing was utterly bizarre. I was thoroughly dissatisfied with this match. Oh, well, it's funny, isn't it? To see how far the... The women have come. So this is 2002, and on this pay per view, they've got a three minute match. Now they have their own Royal Rumble. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So there's more games, so much, and, yeah. right? And just so much more depth to the women's division. And yeah, just back here, it just they, they just didn't really have it in the ring, and they're, they're trying to get Trish over as a star, which she pretty much was from day one. But she's still trying to catch up in terms of in ring. And the only thing I thought was funny about this match is Trish hit jazz with the satisfaction for like a false finish but then yeah. she won with like a normal running bulldog yeah, which i thought was I kind of odd <laughs> but uh yeah it, this was just a, a a spot clearly just to get trish on the show and uh it was what it was but now we're coming up to the street fight with rick flair and vince mcmahon and the recap package that they play is really mad and really fun if you haven't seen it before so i missed out on all i've seen the pay-per-view before a long time ago but i missed out on all of the stuff leading up to it and i also forgot about it before i rewatched. so i missed out on all of the stuff leading up and it's hilarious so basically if you don't know flair tricks shane and stephanie into selling their company shares to him, which makes him joint majority owner with Vince. <laughs> and now as company partners, and also as Vince's contract has him down as owner slash performer, Rick's, what I can only imagine is a hostile takeover plan, is to defeat <laughs> Vince in the ring. He then knocks out Vince cold, and then there's this top-down camera angle over Vince, and he's literally cross-eyed, Ooh. all he needs is like the <laughs> like in a cartoon right and it's, he just needs a little cartoon bird circling over his head and the whistling sound <laughs> then after that vince says you don't know who you're messing with so you expect some kind of really brutal retaliation instead he just vince just walks around in rick flair's robe with a wig on and that, <laughs> that really great. upsets rick like really makes him mad so it worked which is hilarious then vince hits him on the head with a pipe and 
you know all these Vince McMahon memes and animated GIFs? Yes, I said GIF. There's a part here where he runs down to the ring with a metal pipe in his hand with his full business suit on, and he looks absolutely unhinged. And, I was all, and I'm and i watching this. I'm surprised that that bit never became a meme in itself. <laughs> Him in his business suit running down with the pipe looking insane. Anyways, Rick wins the street fight by making Vince tap out to the figure four in 14 minutes 55 obligatory for us at this stage i feel like vince needs to go on the list with ken shamrock and steve blackman of people who just have to comment <laughs> on their physique off whenever they appear on something that we cover uh on the podcast. Vince in his like mid 50s here something like that he Dude, looks he's God. i think he was apart from triple h and i know for a fact you want to talk about triple h's physique later, <laughs> spoiler he had probably apart from triple h he probably had the best physique val venus was looking came back looking shredded but Vince just looked insane. One of the best on the on the entire event. So, yeah, I mean, obviously Vince is super into his bodybuilding. That's obviously one of his biggest passions in his life. So if he's going to go out there and perform, obviously he wants to look the part. I was thinking that because I was I was thinking about the Vince McMahon attire and the Vince McMahon attire over the years, and I always thought it was funny. Like, wouldn't it have been fun if Vince McMahon had wrestling gear? Like, can you imagine Vince well, like, trunks no trunks. and boots? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would have been kind of fun to see. In the, the build-up video to build this match, I, I think they quoted this quite a few times. Vince McMahon says, I enjoy destroying lives. Mm -hmm. It turns me on. He says that multiple times. I enjoy destroying lives. It turns me on. I was thinking, is this Vince McMahon or is this Twitter? Yeah, <laughs> very good. That's what they they can do now. They can take that. Like yep. we need to make that a meme when describing Twitter, or should I say X? Let's hope they don't come after me. I enjoy destroying lives. It turns me on. That is true. <laughs> what well, is just a great I've... heel heel thing to oh, say? He's... But, yeah, <sighs> he's so this, good, man. This whole thing, um, this whole thing was just absolutely awesome loved it from start to finish oh thank god i for loved some it. reason have was terrified right leading up to this recording that you were going to bad mouth this no for some this reason. was all as like, a less gimmick focused guy i thought, uh, I thought you it was break all my heart. sports entertainment um one thing i will say is so this was 22 years ago yeah i know 22 years is a long time but flair he looks so young here compared to how he looks now I know what you mean. Yeah. Like here, it's like, it's he, like he's he, aged like 40 years and 10 years or something. Yeah. Right. Like here he looks still looks, yeah, looks, looks good. Uh, looks great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I find really funny about this is, so they brought Ric Flair into the WWE and they, they brought him in to not be a wrestler, just to be an on-screen personality. And okay. I didn't know that. that. Yeah. And the whole idea was he wasn't going to wrestle whatsoever. Then this kind of storyline kind of was like, oh, do you think you could do one? It kind of led to, you know, oh, oh, we kind of need to do this wrestling match. So we're going to have Flair wrestle. So this was supposed to be a one-off. And then this happened and this went so well to the point where I think his next match was he ended up wrestling The Undertaker at WrestleMania because they had no one for Undertaker to wrestle. They were like, oh, you can wrestle Ron Ram Dam or you could wrestle someone else. And Taker was like, let me wrestle Flair, which I'm glad he did because that match was awesome and then flair just seemed to find himself wrestling and wrestling more to the point where like he's in evolution and he's going on the house <laughs> yeah. shows and he's wrestling like five times a week again you know what i mean like i went and saw a bunch of house shows in the uk where flair was wrestling on them and he was wrestling like 30 minute matches with i don't know Shawn michaels or with benoit whoever else and it's like i just thought it was so funny how it's like He's coming here not to wrestle whatsoever. Then he just ends up wrestling like a full time schedule for them. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah, but no. Um, obviously this was all sports entertainment. What I love about it is just it just proves that because the crowd is going nuts the whole entire match and they're reacting to everything. And you got Vince McMahon. That's not you know he's not really a wrestler. You got Flair, who at this point is obviously relatively limited. But yes. it just shows you just how much of a beautiful match you can have and but, a great story. Yeah, they really put on a show. Man. Right. Just by, you know, telling that story and like everything they do is very simple. It's not like they're doing a whole bunch of high spots or doing any, you know, cool moves or anything else. But they've still got the audience just eating out of their hand. And like honestly, that both of them are, are the you know, two of the best guys to 
ever do it. And I'm, I'm going to count Vince in that. And just because maybe you would say Vince is one of the greatest sports entertainers of all time. But with Vince, he, I want to say until that match he had with Bret Hart at WrestleMania, which was really, really terrible. Um, before that, I don't think Vince ever had a bad match. Like all of Vince's matches were always amazing, you know, and I'm, obviously they're going to be amazing when he's, you know, he's wrote the story. He's yeah, he can give yeah, himself yeah. the time. He can do whatever he wants. I mean, that's not obvious, but um, yeah, like it, Vince was just a great, great performer. And every time he had a match, it was a spectacle. And yes, a lot of smoke and mirrors, you know, here, uh, Flair is bleeding and, they kind of get his family involved who are set at ringside. Great bit, great yeah, the bit. The low blows and uh, yep. and uh, the pipe comes out and everything else. But yeah, Vince is just, Vince has got to be the best heel of all time, huh? Oh, 100%. Yeah, and he was on fire here. He was. So he was. good. <laughs> so the bit where, obviously this is my favorite bit and you know it is, he rips the camera from, uh, from Rick's daughter's hands, takes a selfie with her bloody dad, and then just throws this expensive camera back to her to hope that she catches it. And then just carries on beating up her dad. It's just, dude, he's so good. He's so good. <laughs> I wish I didn't think like this. I'm just reading my notes. I wish at least, I wish I wasn't so catty and I'm going to work on this. But I've got, you know, when he does his deliberately bad Ric Flair impression with the robe and the wig. And yeah. I've got still better than the guy in the Iron Claw. <laughs> dude like that that's actually been a big thing you know we've commented on how everyone other than us at least in the wrestling community seems to love the iron claw film but what everyone is saying is how bad the rick flair was in, in the iron claw and what's really random is like they give in the iron claw like flair does the whole like rick flair promo and stick and it just didn't really seem necessary for the movie at like it didn't contribute to the story whatsoever oh, didn't so I, they, no. they obviously felt like they had to get this in but my question is why because the guy that was doing it was not good at all if he was really good at it be like oh let's put it in the movie it'd be fun but he was really bad at it and they insisted him having like a whole promo over any other side wrestler in the movie yeah um so yeah that, and you're, he, but you do you know what sorry you're right because like let's say he did the best impression ever it still wouldn't add to the story that they put the entire promo in you're right no yeah. no you know but it's he's hmm. getting a lot of hate that rick flair like basically the wrestling community their their whole sort of summary is the movie's awesome the only thing we can knock is how bad the rick flair was <laughs> so interesting choice i feel bad for the guy but it's, it's what it is if you are the only person in the world who can't do a rick flair impression <laughs> but a movie producer comes up to you and like hey do you, we'll pay you and do you want to be in a movie but you've got to be rick flair would you would you take that job yeah they, like I, I would yeah but it sucks it sucks for the guy <laughs> well if you if you want to hear our opinions on the iron claw yes. you can go back and listen to our iron claw review episode so if you haven't already go back and listen to that but no this Again, just Ric Flair is on fire here. The yeah. crowd is super duper into it. He wins with the figure four, which he seemed like he had never won. And, and Flair, like Vince's reactions to everything are just so, so good. And the way he takes the chops, it's ah, yeah. ah, the way he <laughs> screams, it's just, just absolutely perfect. Like this was, this is, I love uh, this. To this so point, much, man. to this point, this is by far the highlight of the show. To yeah, this point, I love this least. so much. <laughs> Early on, We'll move on to the next match. But early on, Vince is looking both smugged and super ripped. And he starts doing classic bodybuilder poses aimed at Flair to like mock him. And it looking at that, it makes me want to, first of all, get absolutely jacked. Hmm. And then second of all, go around like socially manufacturing scenarios where I'm in the right, just so I can do that pose and look <laughs> as smarmy as Vince McMahon. It did look super fun to do that, didn't it? <laughs> We just spoke. We just spoke uh, about the Hogan poses. So yeah, yeah, yeah. What yeah, Vince okay. is doing. Stephanie is backstage telling Michael Cole how Triple H is better than anybody else in the Rumble, and that she wishes she could smash Deborah's face in, all within earshot of Stone Cold, who says what at her loads. Stephanie corpses runs away. And then Stone Cold says, what a lot at Cole. You brought the trivia last week. I'm bringing some wrestling trivia this week. Did you know that the what chant is the worst thing that's ever happened to wrestling? Yeah. I, I don't know if it's the worst thing to happen to wrestling, 
but I felt like it, it I don't really like the what version of Stone Cold Steve Austin. No. I'm watching him here in January 2002. He's still mega, mega over with the audience, mm-hmm. but there's definitely not quite that spark to Stone Cold Steve Austin that they would have in, say, 1998. Is, would you say that's fair? Totally fair, because you've mentioned jumping the shark before. I can't remember why and under what context, but it was always Stone Cold made the bit and you can join in if you want. Whereas what? I feel like the crowd made the bit and then Stone Cold's following along. And like when he's in on the act, you, you lose something. Possibly. I mean, obviously this what thing came from Steve Austin's heel turn. And no, I know, I know. But then when the crowd ran with it, I feel like mm-hmm. that's when they decided to run with it themselves. Yeah, and then it's like every promo everyone does, everyone's what, what, all of Austin's os- offense, what, what. The yeah. crowd likes to, they like to be involved. They like to interact, you know? You see that a lot mm-hmm. now when they're kind of singing a lot of the rest of entrance musics and everything else. Um, that's fine and that's which cool is fine. You, you, yeah. you pay for your ticket to you know it, be it did get really time. but it, this got this got really egregious when it was like every promo anyone did yeah people were so what? old it, so yeah fast. i you know so austin wouldn't last much longer than this he um you know he went out with wrestlemania 19 with his match with the rock and it does make me wonder had Austin's stayed around They say he didn't have the injuries and he didn't retire. Like what would have happened to Austin? Like, I wonder if he would have fell down the card somewhat, you know, cause there's obviously other people they wanted and needed to push. It's kind of interesting to think about, or uh, you also feel like Austin wouldn't have allowed himself to, to go down the card. But yeah, I, um, and dude, that whole heel turn with Austin and putting Deborah with him and just they, a lot of stuff, I think hurt, Stone Cold Steve Austin. You think like, how could they go wrong with him? But I guess he's partly to blame. He wanted to do the heel turn. Like it wasn't anyone else's idea. It was his. Yeah. And they, they felt like yeah. they owed it to him to do it. But yeah, I would say, I mean, he's still, he's still at the end of the day, Stone Cold Steve Austin. But to me, almost felt like out of place here in 2002. Definitely lost something along the way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. But we're then greeted to a flashback as to why Chris Jericho is walking around carrying two belts, introducing the undisputed championship match between that man, Chris and the rock, which Chris Jericho wins via a bit of horseplay and a cheeky schoolboy pin in 18 minutes and 50 seconds. But Marty, can you explain undisputed to me? So he's got two belts. If the rock won, does he win both belts? Like, yeah. What was this? I didn't, I got, I was kind of confused. So when the invasion angle happened, when WCW tried to invade the WWF, we've obviously reviewed invasion. If you'd like mm-hmm. to go back and listen to our episode of WWF invasion, they brought the titles with them. So the WCW title was on WF TV. And of course the WF world title was, and um, they decided rather than having two world champions. So after WCW, after WF beat WCW, they still kept the titles around, I guess, or at least the world title they did. And I can't remember, I guess, I think was Jericho the WCW champion or maybe the rock was, I can't remember, but either way, they said, we can't do two world champions. So they did a pay-per-view vengeance where they did a four man tournament with Jericho, Kurt Angle, the rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin to declare the undisputed champion, which shockingly Chris Jericho won by defeating the rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin in the same night. So for a while, he had the the both belts, which he has here, and then he lost it to Triple H WrestleMania. No spoilers. And eventually, I think after Triple H had both belts, they decided to make it into one belt, which was the mm-hmm. undisputed title. Which uh, what's the best way to describe that belt? That belt, the undisputed title. I seem to think of Brock Lesnar most when I think of that title. We would have seen it on the show before because Survivor Series 2002. We also reviewed, but yeah, here both championships and. Um, this I do remember this match quite a lot because it was like the ultimate heel finish from Jericho. Mm-hmm. And obviously, you know, the rock's not just doing it, not just doing a job. And I think the, what was the finish? He like, he put rock's head into the undisposed turnbuckle, low blowed him 
and got his feet on the ropes. Was that what it was? It was like yeah, he rolled him up and got his feet, feet on the ropes. Yeah, as well. all three yeah. things, like all three finishes in one. Um, but no, this was an interesting time for the WWE because obviously at Vengeance they decided to go with Jericho, who I remember actually at the time in Vengeance being like, I actually predicted that they were going to do something out of left field and, and put Jericho over. I don't think Jericho was really quite ready yet for this role i don't know if he i felt like he at this point he was a much better baby face than he was a heel i felt like at this point when he was a heel he had a tend it was kind of discussed this before he he had a he kind of went a little bit hokey sometimes mm. which can be entertaining but i felt like kind of hurt him in his standings as a wrestler he just did not seem nowhere near as big a deal as the rock or Austin or even triple H or undertaker, which is totally understandable because those guys, you know, legends. I felt like when he did the hill turn later on, when he was doing like the suit Jericho and he feuded with Shawn Michaels, like more like 2008, he really mastered being a heel here. Obviously they're trying hard to push Jericho. And yeah, I mean this, this year's WrestleMania again, no spoilers, triple H wins the rumble and wrestles Jericho at mania. And they have to follow Rock and Hogan, which is just like <laughs> they had no chance of doing whatsoever. So, I mean, they can never take that away from Jericho, the first undisputed champion. Uh, I don't think it really worked. And you know what? I, I felt like Jericho was trying a lot of stuff out when he became undisputed champion. And I feel like he kind of forgot what got him there. And I don't know why, but I felt like, so for some reason, when he won this undisputed title, he started to wrestle with his hair tied in a ponytail. Mm -hmm. And I actually felt like he just didn't look as impressive when he had the, the ponytail. He didn't look as, he didn't look as large in life as he did when he wrestled with the hair. Had those down. long flowing golden locks. Yeah. yeah. No, he looked yeah. miles better like that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah. And it's an, I felt like I was a massive, massive fan of Jericho when he was a baby face during 99 and 2000 to the point where where he's heel where he's a heel here it almost seems like you're kind of disappointed that he's a heel because he also he wasn't he wasn't trying to be a cool heel which is good but i don't know i felt like the way that he tried to get heat and stuff i felt like it just didn't present him as much as a main eventer and then later no, on didn't. like stephanie joint stephanie joins him over triple h and it kind of feels like they were trying to you know get heat for jericho by using stephanie like like Mm -hmm. Jericho couldn't do it by himself. You know what I mean? So yeah, it, just, well, it just didn't seem to work. Yeah. Well, here he kept stealing the rocks taunts and trying to steal the rocks moves and use them against him and everything. And to me, that just made him seem insecure, mm, you know? Really? Yeah. That's why I don't feel like he worked as a hill. He seems just like way too insecure. He's, <laughs> he's physically shorter than the rock, which doesn't matter that much, but when they're squaring off and he's, has that diminutive stature compared to the rock. And then he's just stealing the guy's moves. It was almost like a big brother, little brother thing going on. And I just, yeah. Oh, I should mention, I've got in my notes. There was such a long rest hold in this that I thought I was watching my boy IRS for a second. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, no, the, the, I did think this match was awesome. I thought it was a great match. Actually. I should say I liked the match, but there were some, weird moment like some dull moments at the start and only a couple but yeah the match was good the it really was picked good. up towards the end of the false it finishes did. it yes. um it really picked up the rock's looking super lean here he, he definitely started this is when rock started to become more into a body guy here he's like a lot more lean here than he is say like in 1998 yeah. he definitely tried to hold on as long as he could bless some of the rock right to his hair to his hairline huh? yes like yeah. his hairline like, is like, like me <laughs> Yeah, you're doing the right. He, like, I think it was, was it 2002 or 2003 where he, he three. just, it, it, maybe three, where he shaved it all off. Yeah. And that was the best move he could do because, yeah. dude, it's so funny when people have like the really far back hairline and they have the bit of hair, it just makes them look so much older than they are. It does. Like, it does. <laughs> I, I kind of, I forgot kind of how bad The Rock had it here. Do you know what I mean? Like, like he, he normally looks so freaking cool and it's like here yeah. uh, but yeah shaving his head definitely worked definitely well for the rock but yeah the crowd is rocking and rolling i mm -hmm. think the rock probably has the best nip up in wrestling history i know people may argue Shawn michaels but 
the finesse that The Rock did it with, you know, and the fact how big your guy he is, I just thought The Rock snip up was just so good, and he made it look so easy as well. Yes, he did. Yeah, no, I'm with you on that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. What what muscles does that require the most to do? Would it be his legs or not? Um, maybe I guess hips. I guess. Hips. Um, Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can do it, um, but nowhere near as well as this and i'm also not super duper confident with it where i can hit it every time i'm actually bet i can do like a rolling version of it which i find much easier than just uh, laying down doing it so um it's a funny move the nip up and it's been like i said it's been used in wrestling quite a lot but yeah the rock just now is his, his i'm with you on that one nip up here but it does seem it's interesting they went with they went with jericho and triple h as the main event of mania and just think you see this match and who is in the rumble and you do think like hmm like what other possible outcomes could they have done it and it did feel like jericho versus triple h maybe wasn't the biggest match for us mania which obviously it wasn't because it got overshadowed by the the rock and hogan that being said, I guess they thought the story was, you know, Triple H returning, being a babyface and winning the world title at WrestleMania. But then also like the Austin seemed in a weird space at Mania where he wrestled Scott Hall and that wasn't overwhelming. So there was a lot of stars here. Like it, there's a lot of potential of what they could have done. I guess they couldn't have done the Rock and Austin again. Well, yeah, they did do it the right. year after. Um, so yeah, but they were trying to make a star here in Jericho. And I don't really feel like it worked to kind of years later, like after this title run felt like Jericho went down the card. If anything, he kind of went back to the, uh, the kind of intercontinental level and everything else. So, but yeah, this match though, as a match, I thought it was an awesome match. Yep. I liked it. I liked it. We head to WWF New York again, no Stacey Keebler, but they actually managed to find an even sexier model. Uh Oh, we had HBK in a full Texan cowboy attire. Yeah. Giving his ideas as to who is going to win the next event, the 30 man Royal Rumble. He predicts Stone Cold or The Undertaker and is way off, by the way, because it's Triple H who wins in just under an hour and 10 minutes. Yeah. Boom. Royal Rumble. It, as a whole, this Royal Rumble, I felt like was pretty enjoyable the year is 2002 and you know this is not long after the whole invasion angle they wrapped that up at survivor series so you'd think you have like a whole bunch of talent because they've got the wcw guys and the wf guys but obviously there's things like there's other factors injuries and stuff go into this but uh yeah this rumble i felt like the first half was not so great and it was very like back loaded heavy with main event talent if that makes sense like it seemed like they saved all the big names for the second half of it but um one interesting thing about this rumble and what a lot of people may remember it for is Mm -hmm. they had announced before the rumble that we were going to see the returns of val venus gold dust the godfather and mr perfect and they had announced that before the rumble and advertised that on tv how do you feel about that the fact that they decided to advertise that versus having them be surprise entrance in the rumble. I feel like we could always go with 50, 50, like maybe announce a couple and leave some Mm. wild cards in because I feel like some hype is good. So I'm actually not mad about it being revealed. I just think they should have kept some in their pocket. I, yeah, I do as well. I mean, obviously, I mean, them announcing it, I don't think that would have helped contribute to the 670,000 buys this pay-per-view did. I mean, maybe a little bit, maybe. Um, but I think it was a shame that at least to have, they didn't seem to have any surprises in this rumble. Cause I guess those well, guys would count as a surprise. Yeah. They, didn't, and they already announced them. So like, I think for, for example, having Mr. Perfect surprisingly turn up, I think would have been incredible. Been great. You know I mean? And then surprisingly like leave it until he was the final in the final four. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. get to that. I mean, yeah. so the start of this rumble, it kind of just starts out as a kind of typical Royal Rumble. Oh, and it's for kind sure, of, right? The mid cars <laughs> we're just trying to get through. The first big kind of spot slash angle, um, it's probably another thing this rumble is uh, well remembered for, but Maven eliminating yep. The Undertaker. Um, and I think this was like Maven's debut as well, I want to say. Like he did, this is pretty much straight off 
tough enough. Tough enough. Wow. Okay. Yes. And obviously he'd have some more training, but um, you know, he comes out and they do the great spot where Undertaker's beating up the Hardy boys yes. and then turns his back and Maven hits like a picture perfect drop kick and drop Undertaker kick goes, goes yeah. yeah, Undertaker goes over the top rope so perfectly. They completely nailed this. And um that I guess, you know, we didn't have any surprise entrances, but that was a great I've got Shock that as a su- surprising moment, right? For sure, yeah. Maybe an eliminating taker is an iconic bit and definitely part of Royal Rumble history. Yeah. And it's just a shame Taker ruins it with a disgusting chair shot straight afterwards. Oh, geez. Well, obviously, yeah, to get Taker's heat back, they did the whole thing, yeah. which I thought was pretty entertaining. Uh, yes, where it Undertaker was. just, you know, went on to beat R- Maven up for the next five minutes or so yeah um yeah but i do drag them all around backstage as well through popcorn (laughs) machines right right and uh maven Maven eliminated by somebody who's not a legal entrant well maven didn't no he taker didn't even eliminate him maven went through the ropes no he didn't he did no he didn't did he hundred percent because i thought the same as you and you know i get they funny about into this the stuff ring and throw him back out when scotty too hotty is making his entrance the undertaker mm-hmm. rolls maven back mm-hmm. into the ring and then throws him over the top rope 100 percent confirmed now you can you can say undertaker wasn't a legal man at that point does that still mm-hmm. count and i guess under the royal rumble rules it does because there's no disqualifications it's just if you go over the top rope you're out so yeah maven's legally eliminated I feel like they kind of bend the rules depending on the story. Oh, like of course. They, oh, yeah. Come another on, day, totally. could be like, no, he's still in it. The guy wasn't yeah. um, part of the Rumble. I do like that aspect of the Rumble where I think they should always play on that, where like guys that you would never normally see interact with each other can mm-hmm. have a moment in this Rumble. And the idea that anything can happen as well, I think uh, is, you know, it's the exciting part of the Royal Rumble. So I thought this spot was just absolutely fantastic and like it wasn't like the undertaker lost anything by being no, eliminated this way like whatsoever i feel like wherever you got eliminated by him or the rock i don't think really made any real difference um they still haven't with the royal rumble and i guess they can never really do this because the winner you know gets a title shot at wrestlemania but they've never had like a non-main eventer it seems win the royal rumble no, of course not. Like they've yeah, never had a crazy, mid card right? or a low card guy. Like the closest I think was when Santino Morella almost won the Rumble, yeah. um, and then he ended up getting thrown out. But I feel I do feel like that would be just a really cool surprise or just something to happen where it's like uh, anyone can win because they always say that like any man can win, you know, mm-hmm. every man for himself. Oh, I would like that. Yeah, but it's not really like any man can win, and uh, it seems like could they not at least. I mean, I do hate it when they go back on it, but could they have like a mid-card guy win and be like massive shock? And then, yeah. you know, he loses his title match at Mania um, to someone else. You know, he loses the number yeah. to someone else. Yeah. But I guess it kind of, that waters down the Rumble concept, I guess. But um, no, that was a really awesome moment. And then later on, I mean, when Austin comes out, the, the crowd goes absolutely nuts. And... Mm. Austin is beating everyone up until Triple H comes out and gets another massive pop. And then it's like the showdown between Triple H and Austin. And it's interesting here because for the majority of time, it was always Triple H is the heel, but here he's a baby face as well. And another good moment I remember from this rumble has been uh, the Hurricanes. Music Dude, hits and he comes this out is the best. And he tries the double choke slam on yes. Austin and <laughs> Triple H. And it's so good because you were speaking earlier about the Royal Rumble giving an opportunity of people to interact with each other who where they normally won't. And this is the best example of that. Yeah. It's it was Stone Cold and Triple H. They're throwing everyone else out the ring. And there were these periods where it's almost like you just had a main event singles match where between those two before they were having other entrants coming in, which I thought was really good. Mm-hmm. And then the Hurricanes music hits, like you said, and he tries it, he goes for the double choke slam on Triple H and Stone Cold, and they've been going along with it. And then they look at each other like, hang a minute, why are we going along with this <laughs> kind of bit? And then they just grab him and throw his ass out of the ring. It was so funny. Oh, Hurricane, speaking of character pose. But yeah, it was I love that bit so much. I, and that was I, rem- I love re- these little moments. Yeah, I remember when I watched that at the time, I was actually kind of like surprised that Triple H and Austin went for it. You know what I mean? That's like, what I mean. Yeah, it comedy, was so but- good. So yeah. I, I really enjoyed that. The big boss man is here in the rumble and I don't oh. think I've ever sp- spoken about this on the podcast before. So, cause he came back to the WF in what 98 when he's like the corporate boss man. And obviously he's quite 
a bit older but like this like corporate boss man or where he's wearing this like black outfit uh i suppose it's supposed to be more like a like a swat team something like that yeah like right. an urban response guy or something i don't know this big boss man compared to the like the late 80s big boss man to me it almost just seems like a completely different wrestler like i don't sometimes i don't even put two and two together that that's the same wrestler like he he was kind of he was just like when he was doing this gimmick later on it just seemed like he was just there and he was like kind of like a yeah. nobody do you know what i mean whereas the big yeah. boss man back in the day was like a big star big deal um, yeah totally. yeah, yeah. Um, so it was interesting seeing him in here I kind of forgot that he was around and i think he'd missed the whole there's a lot of wrestlers that missed the invasion angle that were injured and uh triple h was one of them and i think christopher Marr was one of them the big boss man too maybe really interesting to see if he was there another thing ddp gets a massive pop when he comes out yes and it makes sense because they're in atlanta and huge huge pop and the crowd's doing the, the diamond cutter pose but like to this point ddp had been presented by the wf as like a complete loser and chopper so oh, yeah it was oh. really nice to see him get a pop and it does make you wonder like wow if they presented him as a big deal from the start what they could have potentially done with him but for whatever reason never really understand that like no. why they really brought him in to like and i get that he was a lot older but you'd think okay we could at least get a couple of years and get some good stuff out of this guy you'd think like like damn they <sighs> kind of annoys me looking back like if they presented him as a big deal and we would have got the rock and ddp i think that would have been oh, better yeah. than the rock and booker t and if we got austin and ddp like again ddp is a presented as a star like he was in wcw i think all of that could have been really really cool and it just i don't know what happened i guessing someone probably vince just obviously didn't see it in ddp but here in atlanta especially the people knew him one of the other biggest pops i thought for this rumble was when the godfather came out <laughs> and uh yeah, yeah he comes out and like when he first comes out i think four I'm not going to, well, I guess I can say hoes. That's what they call them. He's got his ladies. Yeah. His lady, four uh, hoes come out and then he starts to walk to the ring, but then he walks back and gets more hoes out and more hoes out. And the crowd's really into it. Crowd and ate that up, right? They ate it up. And there's just one point where like he's standing with the girls, like there's like 16 girls or whatever. And he's standing there dancing with them and the music's, you know, the bow, 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 bow. and um, you've got like, Jerry Lawler going nuts on the commentary. And mm -hmm. I'm just like, damn, like this is sports entertainment. Do you know what I mean? Like oh, this is for sure. Yeah. This is proper pro wrestling. Like, I just thought it was a really good moment. Um, so good. But I will say, out of the four um surprises, well, I'll ask you, out of the four surprises or the four guys that they brought back for this rumble, who would you say was your favorite? I'll say Val Venus was in good shape, but for me, it was Mr. Perfect for how yeah. well he did in the rumble, man. What about you? So, dude, it's so it's again this is just another disappointing thing so obviously back in the day uh mr perfect was a big star for the wwf and oh yeah he left them for years and was working wcw and everything else and i don't know where he would have been during the invasion angle i don't know if like what happened to him but because he could have been great for the invasion angle but here they they bring him in after that and clearly from this rumble performance it seemed like they had like a lot of plans for Mr. Perfect. Mm. He's in the final three. Why else last... would he be in the fight? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, he, right. and it's not like he came in last and then was happened to be in the final three. Like he puts in a showing. Mm -hmm. He looked in great shape and everything else. And like, you know, he lasted longer than Stone Cold Steve Austin. Right. Um, and I could just tell watching this, that Triple H and Austin just loved, you know, getting in there with Mr. Perfect. And it just seemed like they had big plans for him and they, they obviously wanted him to do well. And then, but this was literally like the highlight of this return. He pretty much went from this. He might have had a match or two with Steve Austin on Raw, but then just sunk right down to the car to the point where he was just doing like the heats and whatever else. And I can only assume it was because, uh, I'm guessing because of his demons, I'm guessing because of his addiction and everything else. I guess they couldn't, they felt like they could not rely on him, yeah. which, you know, he ended up getting fired because of the uh, the yeah. plane ride from hell where he got in a fight with Brock Lesnar. But then I want to say like a year after this, he ends up dying. And, you know, they said about mm -hmm. a drug overdose, maybe cocaine, everything else. So I guess WWE were right to not, you know, push him heavily. Um, 
but it just seems such a shame. Like what, shame. what this Lowe, year could have looked like if you know he could have had matches Things with Kurt are Angle yeah. and just yeah. So that was a big uh, yeah. big shame. But yeah, it was, it was super cool to watch him in this. The other big pop I thought as well was Rob Van Dam, who comes like it's a massive reaction, and he pretty much comes in, clears house for a second or so, then gets tri- pedigreed by Triple H from thrown out, and it's really weird how they just back here. They didn't push RVD or put the world title on him until, was it 2006? Or I, I might be wrong uh, later, but like here in 2000, you know, 2002, 2001, 2002, it really feels like they should have pulled the plug with Rob Van Dam because he was freaking over, man, huh? Like, oh, yeah. This is the most well, over he nuts was. For him. Oh, yeah, he, definitely. People were and so, he's so excited. so good as well. So excited. Yeah. Like people go mad for him. He's so good. He's so kind of energetic and fun to watch and, really dynamic in the ring. I really feel like if there's one person from ECW where it's, I'm surprised he didn't make like the main, main, main upper echelons of WWE, it would be him. But Booker T too. Well, they both won world title. Booker T I'd say was a legit main eventer. Van Damme had his world title shot and stuff. He was definitely up there, but yeah, Mm. I I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. But um, like I said, the second half of this was booked a little it, it's, it felt like there was more thought into it. Like we get, you know, the stare off or the fighting between Kane and the big show and that yep. whole thing. Um, Booker T comes in at number 30 and doesn't last long at all. No, he doesn't. So, he does, no. no, you could tell they were just like over these WCW wrestlers. That they put in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, Mr. Perfect. And it's a big pop when he hits the perfect plex as well. Like the audience yes, was, it was. was ready for Mr. Perfect. But uh, yeah, he ends up, ends up coming down to Triple H and Kurt Angle. And I think it was pretty obvious at the time who was going to win. Triple H, you mentioned it earlier. He'd obviously had all this time off from tearing his quad and just, you know, worked his ass off because he comes back looking, you know, yeah. absolutely phenomenal. And just <laughs> like, it, it, it's kind of like who else could have won this Rumble, you know, him looking like that. Um, right. But Triple H won the Rumble. I think it's fair to say Triple H is a better heel than Babyface, huh? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Right? They're like two different people. Yeah. yeah, I don't care about I don't care about Babyface Triple H. No, and the thing is, people still love him when he's a heel, but I feel like he needs to be a heel, huh? Maybe that's why his match with Jericho didn't work so much either. I feel like the other way around, with Jericho's a babyface and Triple H's a heel works much better personally. I just feel like he needs that edge, like he relies mm-hmm. on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Love Triple this- H. Yeah absolutely but no overall i thought it was a pretty entertaining rumble the story of the match for yep. me was first half of it mm, a bit lackluster second half of it it picked it up a notch and got pretty enjoyable and there was quite a lot of star power some good nostalgia so was it the best rumble no was it better than the 1998 rumble which we reviewed last week i'd say absolutely yep. um i'm it's going above on the list for me we'll rank yes them. As a whole, a whole show. Well, I guess actually, let me ask you first, Sam. What was your favorite match? Oh, it was the street fight for Blair sure. I loved, I loved it, man. I loved it I, so much. I kind of almost want to say a tie with that and the Jericho and Rock, but actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with the street fight as well. The worst match? Oh, I, the, it was, it was the ladies, unfortunately. For me, we would know mine. It's the Edge and Regal match because yeah, at least, I, I the, can't agree. At least the Trish match was quick. The True. Edge and Regal yeah. one seemed to drag for me and dragged dragged it down. Um, overall, as a show, what rating does Royal Rumble 2002 get for you, Sam? I'm giving it a 3.5. I absolutely Ooh. loved the street fight. The Royal mm. Rumble was pretty good, and the rest of it kind of average. And it, I mean, overall, was I more satisfied with this than Survivor Series 2002? I think I gave that a four, and I wasn't, even mm. though like. The street fight was better than anything overall on the card of Survivor Series 2002. I just felt like as a whole, it's it's below Survivor Series 2002. So 3.5, I think, is very fair. What That's about pretty you, high. man? I'm going to give it uh, three stars, and mm-hmm. that might sound low because you just said 3.5, but we've got to remember, three stars are still better than average. Do Over average, being? yes. yes. Yep. So I think like that's a pretty fair rating for it because... I think without the street fight, I would have maybe said average, but the Same. street fight was awesome. And, um, you know, the, the crowd is in Atlanta and they were pretty rowdy all night. And I think that, that helped a lot. So definitely enjoyable. It's definitely one you can go back and watch and enjoy. So if you're listening to this podcast, maybe go back and watch it. If you have, haven't done already before listening to this podcast. I was just um, going to say, would you recommend people go back and watch this one? I I would. Yeah. And you would as well. Awesome. Yeah. 
I, I think so. And I think it's quite fun watching Royal Rumbles leading up to the Royal Rumble. And uh, I think we've decided that, right, Sam, that next week's episode, we're going to review the 2024 Royal Rumble. Is that right, Sam? If you're back in time, you said you're traveling. Yes, I'm wrestling the night of Royal Rumble, but I will be able to watch it that night. And then I'll review it with you on the Sunday to release okay. on the Monday. In a it's going to be a tight yeah, turnaround. <laughs> this is going to be a tight one, but we're going to do it. It's definitely, definitely worth reviewing. Uh, well, it's Rumble season. It's got to be done. I'm looking forward well, to it. I am as well. And speaking of reviews, um, please, guys, we need some more reviews on Apple Podcasts or whatever it is. Uh, please give us a five-star review. That would be really nice. And if you write something nice as well, we'll read it out on the show. If you're not already yes. following us on the social media, follow us at The Villain Pod. We're on YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram. And yes, I think that's pretty much it as far as I'm concerned. Have a wonderful Royal Rumble season and have a good week till next week.